Yes, uh, good morning everyone and thank you Sarah. Also thank you to the UKCP. When I uh, first got this invitation, uh, it was surprising and a bit daunting because I have someone who's never actually touched a book on psychology uh, and I only um, uh, visited a counsellor for the first time in my life earlier this year. So being here is, uh, for me, it's part of my own journey uh, in learning uh, about uh, psychotherapy and exploring how psychotherapists uh, can actually help um, our, the predicament we, we find ourselves in now. And um, <clears throat> yes, you mentioned Extinction Rebellion. So it's important, I think, to, to note that we're gathering today after two weeks of action uh, across, across London. Uh, and uh, I, I was, um, I'll come to why I wasn't able to be involved in a moment, but uh, it was quite amazing to see uh, a whole range of friends. Uh, for example, Je Jeffrey uh, Newman, a 77-year-old, 77-year-old um, young rabbi, uh, sitting in front of the Bank of England and, and, and being arrested. And for those of you who don't know anyone who's taking non-violent civil disobedience, uh, it's, I'd say, so just take a moment to think, what is it that is moving people to decide to actually uh, risk arrest and potentially a painful arrest uh, in order to communicate how now climate change is such an important thing in their lives. And I think that's what Extinction Rebellion is doing through taking nonviolent direct action, is helping us see that for some people, increasing numbers of people, this is becoming so important that they put the rest of their lives uh, on hold. Now, I, I think I've, I've, I've had my eyes on a, opinion polls for a while because I'm interested to know the extent to which people in different countries are uh, waking up to climate change. And there was a YouGov poll uh, in July uh, of 28 countries, and in all but four of them, the majority of people asked, said that they thought climate change would have a fair amount or great deal of impact on their own lives. So we are seeing a shift in, in, in awareness and therefore anxiety about that. But I'm not here because of the growing numbers of people who are presenting uh, and, well, asking for, for counselling because of eco-anxiety. I'm here because I'm interested in how psychotherapists uh, can play a role in communities and helping uh, communities actually understand how to support uh, each other in the anxieties associated with this, uh, which are, I believe, only going to, to get worse. And I've, I've been witnessing a social phenomenon since just over a year when my deep adaptation paper came out, which is that, that people are, in, in response to this information about climate change, are, are rebelling in a different way. They're rebelling in terms of the norms of our society, in terms of what emotions are, are somehow allowed or invited to be expressed publicly. I'm seeing people engaged in public grieving and uh, sharing despair together. And I think that's really important um, because otherwise keeping those emotions suppressed can lead to other emotions uh, which will uh, create um, perhaps more troubles ahead. So I'm interested in how this shocking news about the climate is actually acting as a catalyst for people to transform. And I think it's because there's something really important in when you're faced with a, an impossible difficulty, something that you can't immediately see a way out of. There's something really important there. It really challenges uh, who you are. And in that context, then a lot of stories of self can can fall away, and you're left with um, you're left with a greater attention to what's most important to you. So often, that's for nearly everyone. Then it's about it's about love. It's about love of people around you, and it's about love of nature, and it's about being fully present in in the current moment. And um, I wasn't able to rebel myself because I was with my dad uh, in Devon 
for a week, um, uh, working with him, looking at all the different treatment pathways for his bladder cancer. And we were looking at, um, I was going online and looking at research papers, and we were comparing what he'd been told by the doctors. We were basically comparing uh, treatment pathways which would give him a, a one in three chance of living beyond five years and a one in two chance of living uh, beyond five years but with many worse side effects in the treatment process, some of which would, could, could last um, beyond that. And that was probably the best week I've ever spent with him in my life. Um, Lieutenant Commander of the Royal Navy, mm -hmm. someone who was away at sea a lot when I was a kid. Um, I don't remember that we ever really connected emotionally. We were emotions. We, we, we played cricket together and we talked about career and money and stuff, but not really about what was on our hearts. And so, I, for me, I mean, for example, um, at one point I cried and Dad got off the bed and gave me a hug. And this, this was for me a yeah, a shift, and I think a shift, um, not just in our relationship, but I think a shift in, in how we, both of us, are experiencing life, being much more focused on the present moment because of that sense of, um, yeah, that we're not in control, that we don't know what's ahead, that life seems more fragile and more precious, everything seems more imper impermanent, and so that really then means that we drop all those stories of postponing uh, having conversations or postponing making those choices to put what's most important front and centre in our lives. So I, I think that's relevant for us um, because um, a few times people have said to me that... Um, we would never tell anyone with cancer to give up. And therefore, why are you, Jim, telling people or implying people uh, that we should give up on climate? So I'm not telling anyone to give up on trying to curb carbon emissions, uh, to try and slow down climate change, and I'm going to come back to that. But I think that comparison I, I often hear, there's quite a few people who are saying this to me, um, I think it reveals something that's problematic. Helping a loved one explore what they want from their life to make conscious decisions not arising from either fear or denial seems the right thing to do. And my dad's doctors first advocated treatment pathways which were purely focused on longevity. And they were quite surprised when he then said, well, I'm interested in quality of life as much as, as anything. And so I want you to support me in looking at all options. Um, and I think it's quite, in the same way, it would be quite normal to when we're faced with a shocking situation of climate, to actually we try and support each other with open minds and open hearts to work out what are the options uh, and, uh, and allow a breadth and depth of conversation about our predicament. And I think it's only then we're going to have meaningful dialogue about all the options. Now, I recognize that to some, uh, some people, um, that can all sound a bit bleak and melodramatic to make that comparison. So what I'm going to do now is um, summarize some of the, uh, the climate science. And I, I, um, I should note that nothing I'm going to say means that any of us here are in, in any imminent danger. Um, however, um, it is terrifying stuff, and I, I don't want to numb myself from this information. It's often it's why I don't give many talks now, because if I was to do it, it would be quite numbing. But um, climate change is, is worse than we were told. It's already one degree warmer globally since 1850, or near 1.5 degrees warmer since 1750. That doesn't sound much, but that's about 11% more energy in the atmosphere uh, since the beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution. And that makes our weather more extreme. Floods, droughts, storms, heat waves, and so on. And that affects our agriculture and settlements. And our climate is changing faster 
than what was predicted. A recent study found the Arctic permafrost is rating at a mel uh, melting at a rate um, that, was, uh, that is 70 years ahead of the worst case scenarios. Um, and when I say worst case scenarios, that's based on business as usual emissions. A geophysics paper published this year estimates we could lose the Arctic summer ice by 2030. Now that matters because of the self-reinforcing feedbacks that exist. For example, melting permafrost releases methane, which is a very strong uh, greenhouse gas. And another feedback, of course, is the loss of the reflective power of white ice. And so one uh, top British polar scientist uh, has calculated that if we lose all of the Arctic summer ice, that will be, uh, give a, a heat-forcing effect equivalent to half of all humanity's emissions ever. And of course, other feedback loops come from our soils drying and releasing carbon dioxide, or wildfires spreading uh, into places that are very unusual, like the Arctic, uh, and releasing carbon dioxide. So we should do all that we can to cut emissions now, but we should not ignore where we're at, whatever we do. For example, there's about a 40-year lag in the full warming effect of carbon dioxide emissions, 40 years after it's released. And also, one study found that about 90% of all energy that's been trapped by additional greenhouse gases has warmed the ocean, 90%. So that means that that heat is there to further warm the air over the coming decades. So one peer-reviewed study said we have a 1 in 20 chance of going extinct by the end of this century because of climate change. Now, that paper was unusual. But the latest models on climate change, the very latest ones that the IPCC will be using uh, next year for their uh, reports, uh, they've been predicting up to seven degrees temperature rise by the end of this century. Now, these are merely models and projections. But what that shows is that some of the best uh, research and best minds are seeing a future which really does threaten um, the future of our species. And it's why the name of Extinction Rebellion, although they've been criticized the last two weeks on the, on the science, uh, actually for that reason, that human extinction now seems possible uh, because of our own actions, um, I think their, their name is warranted. Now, hearing such astonishing information, uh, many people would say, well, yeah, but why didn't IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, say we have 10 years to, to, to drastically cut emissions in order to avoid the worst? Yes, they did, and it's still important to cut emissions and to draw down carbon from the atmosphere, both naturally and to try artificially. But to make their figures seem less scary to policymakers in their 1.5 degree report last October, the IPCC had to imagine uh, negative emissions technologies, which don't exist yet at scale, stripping 250 gigatons of carbon out of the atmosphere uh, and then, with all the other things they recommended, it would give us only a 50-50 chance of staying on one, under 1.5 degrees. However, as Sarah mentioned, our emissions are going up. Um, and if mapped on a graph since 1850, along with land use change emissions, it's near exponential, matches to an exponential curve. So Dr. Wolfgang Nor, who um, produced this graph, uh, calculates that the current rate of emissions mean that we'll have used up the planetary carbon budget by 2025. So there's strong evidence that we're heading for more climate chaos. And societal disruption from climate change is already here. The UN Secretary General said last month in a speech that was pretty much not hardly reported at all that climate, this is a quote, climate disruption is now and everywhere. So climate change is leading to increased hardship and water and food shortages and hunger in many countries, disease and worsening natural disasters, as well as migration and conflict. And last month, the Red Cross reported that two million more people each week need humanitarian aid because of climate chaos. Two million people each week. Now, I realize that many of you who are new to the topic of climate change um, may be thinking, well, what does this mean to our, our daily lives? And I hear a lot of people who are 
waking up to climate change were saying, so, well, can we not turn down the thermostat, um, switch off lights, stop flying, um, buy more local, buy solar panels and so on. And they're all really good things, but they really don't make much difference in con within an industrial growth society that burns fossil fuels for everything. Huge amounts of fossil fuels are used for everything that we interact with um, every day. I mean, if you look at all the food in the supermarket, for example, burning fossil fuels is involved in the production, processing, packaging, distribution, refrigeration, advertising, retail, cooking, and waste processing. And for 30 years, people have tried within this existing system to curb carbon emissions. That graph shows all the different types of policy interventions over that time. And so that graph suggests that we've completely failed. So the risks of climate change are now finally coming to haunt our own lives. So last year, production in UK and Europe of uh, fruit, vegetables and grains slumped by about 20% uh, because of the drought. And in Britain, where we import, some estimates are about 60% of our, all our food we import. Um, finally, uh, the uh, UK Parliamentary Committee admitted that we are facing a food security crisis. Um, for example, because 20% of our food imports uh, come from places which are being severely affected right now, and disrupted by climate change. So we're no longer immune to the climate that we've been destabilizing. And so I think it really is relevant to start asking what would we do if our society begins to break down? It's a shocking question, and many people don't want to even allow such a discussion. Um, but I think in resisting that conversation means we're actually wasting some time to explore and prepare for what may be arriving soon, if not already underway. Now, of course, many experts in many different fields debate whether it's right or wrong to, 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 to talk like this. Um, but as I mentioned, that YouGov poll, um, it even asked people whether they thought um, humans might go extinct. And a majority of people in Asia polled by YouGov uh, thought that humans may go extinct this century uh, because of climate change. Uh, a majority in general, in 28 countries, said that they thought climate change would trigger war. So it's out there in some way, but the connection to uh, how, we pro you know, how we process that or how we talk to each other or what we do about it, I think is still beginning to be made. Um, yeah, so asking people to be less pessimistic about the future, I think, um, is probably a weak response, either intellectually or emotionally, and although I don't know, I would say it's probably a weak approach therapeutically. So I'm going to sh share with you a little bit of my own journey with this stuff. Um, so for years I'd believed the argument that must we, not, we must not give up hope for a better future, as otherwise we would stop trying to create change. But as I looked at the latest science and measurements in 2018, um, it seemed dishonest to let that attachment to hope prevent me from processing what I thought I was seeing. So I began to consider privately the idea that it's too late to stop this. And I discovered many personal fears to do with my own identity. I was scared that losing hope of having a positive impact through my efforts on the environment would mean that I would see my past efforts and struggles uh, as pointless. I worried it would mean I had no idea what to do next. I worried that without an idea of how to be useful, I would feel pointless. And I worried that if it, it could be unbearable to live with such a bleak outlook on the future. But after a time, I allowed that shock, um, grief, and fear, uh, regret and confusion, to all sort of unravel into despair. And the paper I wrote on deep adaptation, looking back on it now, I think it was part of my process, because it was partly uh, a scream of anguish, um, with not really knowing what to do, but an invitation for people to, to start talking with me and with each other about what to do. But I think looking back, I've discovered that allowing that despair can let many other things begin. 
It meant that I could no longer work on the environment as I'd done for the previous 20 years. I gave up the idea that we could reform this system. And I don't just mean capitalism, I mean the whole industrial growth society and the assumptions of progress and human dominion that it's all based on. I also gave up the idea we could change things to another system in time to prevent devastating consequences from what we've done to the climate. So I started to ask deeper questions about meaning and the meaning of hope and what we could hope for and work towards now. And because it's something that I hear so often, hope, we must have hope, I thought I'd uh, talk about it today. Because, yeah, I've been told by a lot of people, Jen, we must have hope over the past year. I've also been told that people like me should not be undermining people's hope. And such views are often stated as if so obvious that they don't need an explanation. But I think unthinking allegiance to hope is part of the way our culture invites us to be averse to emotional pain and to uncertainty. And I believe that it needs to change for us to try to reduce harm from now on. So I'm going to unpack the notion of hope in our time of climate crisis. But I was wondering if it was going to be possible to do that in a speech, in this format, um, because I've actually found that I only get somewhere on this topic in one-to-one -one conversations. Um, on, a, on a retreat I was co-leading, uh, one of the male participants, he said, but Jim, people need hope, and society needs hope. It's important for society. And um, I asked him if, um, because of the way that we were working on that retreat, I asked him to own that statement for himself. So then, okay, yes, I need hope. And then to explore in a conversation, well, what does that mean? How does he feel about that? So what, 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 when he says, I need hope, um, what's the nature of the hope and what's the nature of, of, of the need? And to consider perhaps that might not be so. Uh, and so in that conversation, uh, we ended up in a very different place uh, where he realized that he thought that with him not having hope of a better, materially better future would be emotionally unbearable. And, but in conversation, he realized that, well, that's an emotion, that's not him, it's an emotion that's happening, and that actually, it wouldn't mean that he couldn't go on. It would mean that he would ask different questions about what to do next and what he believes in. So dropping those stories of hope would actually mean that he would think about, well, what is most important to me in my life right here and right now? Uh, and then so he discovered that the story of hope was actually disempowering in terms of what he should be doing right now and also sort of a displacement, as a displacement into some vague sense of the future about when he would fully live according to his perspective and his values. So as I'm an academic, I'll try and um, not just tell that tale, but actually try and offer you a step-by-step -step breakdown of the concept of hope in a time of climate chaos. So first we can explore what we mean by the word or concept hope. Then we can explore what the vision or goal being hoped for actually is. And third, we can explore why we think hope is useful for ourselves or people more generally. So starting with definitions, many people who tell me that we must not lose hope do not say what they mean by the word. Some people mean their wish, some people mean their expectation, and some people mean their plan that are, it's actually quite specific. For each of those forms of hope, it seems they're not things that we should not give up on, because learning about ourselves and our situation often involves giving up on certain wishes, certain expectations, and certain plans. So perhaps when people say we mustn't give up on hope, what they're really saying is we must not stop being positive. And I think this reflects, the, as Sarah said, this sort of uh, habit of positivity in our culture. It means we're averse to difficult emotions and to impermanence. And in the face of climate chaos, many people like myself have come to an, a quite different place, which is positive now, but it's not through being attached to being positive. So a second 
unpacking of, of this concept of hope explore, involves exploring what the vision or goal that we're hoping for is. People who, like me, say that a climate-induced breakdown of our way of life is now likely or inevitable begin to explore new goals and vision, visions which then inform our lives. So I am hoping for a livable planet and a more lovable world, one that maintains life support systems, including for us, um, and where more of us are living presently and lovingly with each other and with nature. And I wish for that, and I work for it, but I'm not expecting it. And for me, accepting that it's too late to stop climate chaos wrecking our way of life is not giving up, but waking up to a wider and a deeper agenda, an agenda that includes questions of how we reduce harm, save what we can, learn how this tragedy came to be, and seek meaning and joy in the process, no matter what's ahead. A third unpacking of hope is to explore why we think hope is useful for ourselves or people more generally. Whereas some people seem to be encouraged by believing a story of a preferred future, others are helped by dropping such stories, even if painful for a time, and then engaging, engaging fully in the moment with a passion for living their truth and yet equanimity with whatever's ahead. In this sense, for some people, accepting that there is much suffering to come from climate chaos doesn't mean that they feel helpless, but they feel powerfully hope-free and newly engaged in life. Now, this allegiance to hope and positivity in our culture also means that we don't allow as much as we might the public sharing and discussion of our emotions of sadness, confusion, and grief in the face of climate change. Nor our longing to connect and to experience wonder at life. Rather, in public and professional life, we invite each other to be happy, positive, and capable. Of course, that's only half the picture. Um, in the, in the mediated world we live in, the news tells us to be fearful or to scoff or sneer or to hate people. And, of course, the advertising media tells us to feel inadequate unless we have the, the latest brand or, or experience. But none of this is helping us to open up to each other vulnerably about whatever's inside. And that, therefore, means that we, in a, the normal culture, are dulling a certain form of knowing. So that's why many people talk about, they sort of intuit that something's really wrong with our society and where we're headed. But we're sort of numbing that. And so in my work, I'm sort of encouraging people to connect with that, to actually validate that in each other and have conversations from that inner knowing. So most people, having those emotions, are not seeking psychological support, like I didn't for, for a long time. Um, and they, like me, I think many people are suppressing those emotions of sadness and fear and grief. And of course, that can then lead to those secondary emotions, anger and blame and hatred. Um, and those may offer a sort of a distraction for a time, but my fear is they're going to make matters worse. So I think it's going to really be helpful to support each other in allowing and exploring those suppressed emotions of sadness and fear and grief. And it's why um, in April, when I spoke at the launch of the International Rebellion for Extinction Rebellion, uh, I said that we're scared, but we're proud enough to say so. We're traumatized, but we're open enough to say so. But I'm here today because I'm interested in what psychotherapy may be able to do to help in this age of climate anxiety. And I'm, I'm new to the, to the profession entirely, as I said earlier. Um, so I've been playing catch up and been reading a bunch of things, all the different articles that journalists are putting out on, on climate anxiety or eco-anxiety. And I read uh, the website patient.info, which tells me it publishes clinical information certified to meet NHS England's information standard. 
So I was interested to see them write about my paper on deep adaptation. I'm going to quote. In one case, a viral academic paper scared people so much that it reportedly caused people to go into therapy, quit their jobs, and move out of the city. <laughs> With seemingly nothing but bad news coming our way, how can we feel more positive and care for our mental health in the age of climate anxiety? End quote. Well, perhaps one way, way might be to go into therapy, quit your job, and move out of the city. <laughs> I think that sounds like a great idea. And the people I know who've sought therapeutic support quit their job or reduced hours and moved out of the city are telling me that they're having the best time of their lives. <laughs> so the article listed a range of useful things uh, for emotional well-being, such as taking some exercise and having some fun. <laughs> but it also talked about a sense of helplessness some of us have in the face of climate change where we sense that we can't do much about the problem. The author used the theory of learned helplessness to suggest that a lack of self-efficacy could lead to depression. Now, I'm new to psychology, so I should be cautious here, uh, but may I tentatively suggest my provisional view is that it's bullshit. <laughs> now, the theory, of course, has horrible origins in electrocuting dogs. But leaving that aside, citing theories like this may be an unconscious attempt to protect the author and the intended reader from their own difficult emotions. As a professor, I know well that impulse to seek refuge by feeling a bit more knowledgeable than others. And as such, it can be a narcissistic defense mechanism that's going to impair the usefulness of psychotherapy in this time of climate chaos. Instead, I would recommend psychotherapists dialogue with people who are experiencing anxiety about the state of our environment, to discover the myriad ways that people are being affected. But if psychologists talk with people expressing anxiety about climate change from an assumption that they have a problem rather than humanity having a problem, then we're not going to get very far. Faced with the latest climate news, anxiety is natural. Moreover, looking at the future we face, despair is natural. Despair is valid. Despair can be and should be transformative in this context. Therefore, I wonder whether psychotherapists will offer that much on climate anxiety if first they haven't allowed themselves <coughs> to go into despair themselves and to learn from that. Um, I think of the, sort of the archetype of the wounded healer in this context. So we need to be in this together because therapists are in danger from climate change now just like anyone. Now, at a top conference for psychotherapists today, I'm not going to recommend people get depressed. And I'm not experiencing, and I haven't experienced depression myself, but I know people who have, and I've witnessed how tough and painful it is. But I've been told by some therapists and some people who uh, have been depressed that um, in the society where they live in now, it's quite a natural response. It's quite a valid response and it's often transformative. And I hear from people who've been in depression that it was a crisis of purpose, and actually, looking back, it seems like some kind of spiritual emergency that actually transformed the way they then would live from then on. They found themselves to be more gentle, more loving to both themselves and others. But some have told me that there was a lack of guidance for them to support them in that aspect, that potential of, of their depression. So I'm wondering, in a time of climate crisis, could we begin to see depression as a rite of passage, a horrible but useful means of positive disintegration of our old stories of self and the future, a means by which we can discover forms of meaning and well-being which do not depend on fitting in better with this society, one that, after all, is committing a massive destruction of life on Earth? So if so, how might we support each other if and when people experience it? And I don't have any answers on this. But I know that if you focus on helping people function better in this destructive society, then I'm not going to mourn psychotherapy if it collapses along with everything else. <laughs> so what can be done? The future is looking really tough. Humanity risks making matters worse as our fear drives us to uncooperative and sometimes even violent behavior. Part of the reason for such a response may be those unrecognized, suppressed emotions that by covering up then lead to anger, to blame, and to hatred. 
as a lay person, I think it important, it's important learning to not react from those unconscious emotions or from our aversion to those emotions. So it's going to be useful to help make conscious some of those emotions that are being suppressed. In my experiences outside mainstream psychotherapy, I've, I've discovered things that, um, that have worked for me. Authentic relating and circling, vipassana or insight meditation, but also practices which helped me experience a sense of self beyond a limited separate one. Um, uh, they involve non-ordinary states of consciousness. And those included, for me, breathwork, shamanic journeys, and spiritual dance. So I wonder if the power of these conscious expanding practices is um, perhaps helping or could help address one of the deepest traumas that we all have, which is the trauma of existing as a separate life form that will die. So with the right guidance, these conscious expanding practices could invite people towards their undiscovered unself. By transcending a sense of separation, one might be freer of all kinds of anxiety, including eco-anxiety. So I would recommend that psychotherapy explores these practices more in future, and of course I'd recommend you start with yourselves. Um, now I hear that good psychotherapy is not available to many people. Um, and not available often unless you're quite wealthy. Um, and it's also something that many people don't look for. So I didn't look for psychotherapy counselling until 46 years of age. And of course, people who don't seek it, suppressing those emotions, could then experience um, well, anger, blame, hatred and so on as a means of escaping their pain. And that will obviously make matters worse. So to help reduce harm, in our societies, there's a need somehow for these psycho this psychotherapeutic support to be offered in community um, across the whole of society without request. It just becomes a natural way that we help each other. And I wonder how that could happen. To scale, it will need to be done through intermediaries, through people who are supported with approaches to host gatherings in settings that are, that are accessible to lots of people. Facilitators offering processes through schools, universities, faith organizations, trade unions, professional bodies, and activist groups. Now, psychotherapists could advise on the processes in those meetings and gatherings, could provide counseling for facilitators and hosts of those, and also be available at those events for those people who are most, most uh, affected um, and need that support. Because the need and opportunity for helping people come together on the climate emergency to explore difficult emotions and future choices is key and is now central to the work of the Deep Adaptation Forum, which I launched earlier this year. And we're discovering and developing ways of providing uh, training and advice online for people to then host spaces in person in multiple locations. So our hope in a time of climate crisis is promoting other ways of responding than fear and anger. Our hope in a time of climate crisis is that experiencing the fragility and impermanence of life can lead more of us to greater gratitude for the present and less involvement in all the judgments and tactics of our minds. We can be freer to love and to forgive each other and ourselves and do whatever we can to help whatever may come. Thank you. <laughs>